you for that introduction. It's uh, very nice seeing all of you also from this perspective. It's, uh, it's our pleasure and honor to start here with the, with the first session. And for that, um, I guess my two guests hardly need any introduction, but I still say a few words about that. So on my right here is uh, Paul Healy, who is the James R. Williston Professor of Business Administration uh, at the Harvard Business School in the Accounting and Management Department. And then here on my left is uh, my colleague Kaiska Ormazawal, a professor of accounting and control and holder of the Grupo Santander Chair of Financial Institution and Corporate Governance. My name is Anne Luz Raas. I'm a professor here in the Managing People Department and holder of the Puts Chair of Global Leadership Development. So with that, I guess I'm someone for whom, you know, the notion of corporate culture and measuring those type of uh, constructs comes maybe a little bit more naturally, but I'm delighted seeing here uh, the interest uh, from such a diverse perspective uh, in, in such an important field of study. So with that, I guess I, I really much look forward. I know already I, I did get a little bit of a sneak preview in, uh, in our two presenters for this panel. So Paul, if I may ask you, and I, I much look forward to, uh, to hearing your take on uh, on the questions around uh, board effectiveness. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, No, it's fine. Oh. It's probably the Okay, that'll do it. So uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much to Jordi and Yese for inviting me. It's really a, a privilege to be here. And actually, after being cooped up in, in Boston for many year, for several years, it's wonderful to be able to travel out, out, out away, leave Boston and come away. Um, Marco, you sort of, uh, when he talked about culture and Canadians um, moving to the US and sticking with their metric culture, made me realize that I'm in Kiwi, I'm a New Zealander, and, and, and I actually uh, avoided the metric system by moving to the US. So that was my, uh, that was my way of keeping my culture. Uh, what I'm going to talk about really is today is the, is the culture of the board, and I, I'll start with, a mo with motivation. Um, GE, this is a, a Wall Street Journal article um, on GE. Uh, Geordie didn't mention GE, but I think the concerns that were raised about board governance certainly apply to GE. And the piece that I particularly like is the part that I've... Um, highlighted in yellow. The, the, first of all, the, the board of GE look, was, is kind of a who's who, it's very well-known people. Uh, and the comment, this is coming from the Wall Street Journal, for 36 years under Jeff Immelt and, and Jack Welch, the board had largely followed the chairman's lead. One newcomer under Welch was so surprised by the lack of debate that the director asked a more senior colleague, what's the role of a GE board member? And the older replied, applause. So, so what I'm gonna try to do today is, uh, is, is take a look at the following questions. How do directors perceive both the uh, operational performance, the internal governance of the, of the board, it's only the board dynamics, and then how do they uh, also understand and appreciate the, the board's effectiveness? We've seen lots of examples of boards uh, maybe doing well, but also examples of board failures. Um, so how do directors themselves perceive uh, these questions? And then second, and this is a more exploratory piece of it, is there any relationship between the two? I mean, you might think that it's pretty obvious that if the board's functioning effectively, the firm will function effectively and vice versa. I'm not sure about that, but, but certainly one might think that um, the board would be uh, an important determinant of the firm's performance. Uh, Prior research on this has focused largely on looking at correlations or relationships between firm performance, actual firm performance, or actual board outcomes and board decisions as a function of board characteristics, the composition of the board, uh, the traits of its, of its directors, and so forth. Um, but there have been recognized limitations to, to that research. First of all, the, the board characteristics themselves are endogenous. Um, but also, I think everyone has recognized that the internal performance of the board, the internal dynamics of the board, as kind of a team, a team of individuals that are collectively making decisions, uh, is likely to be important, but really hasn't been explored. 
And the way I'm going to try and do that is uh, with my co-authors, I'm going to do a, conduct a survey, uh, something as you mentioned is rather new, new, new to me, um, but it struck me as the only way to really start to dig into this question or these questions. So we, we're going to ask a wide uh, range of questions that are based on uh, prior research and practitioner input. Uh, we've tested this survey before we actually implemented it with, um, uh, with the sample that we're going to share with you. It, the data was collected from uh, in 2015 to 2016. There was a 7% response rate. Um, and we, we, the, 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 uh, the survey itself actually covered, uh, it was global. So we had about, about 2,500 uh, directors that we, that, we, that we have responses from. Um, most of them are outside the US. They're from public and from private boards. So I'm going to focus, though, on uh, results for the US public companies. I'll talk a little bit at, toward the end about whether those results seem to hold over for other types of boards or in other parts of the world. So in addition to uh, looking at just the, the survey results, we decided we wanted to collect more qualitative data. And so we did this in two ways. One was in the survey itself, we, we, lay, we gave space for respondents to actually uh, provide qualitative uh, answers to questions, just to expand upon their, their, um, their survey results uh, with some qualitative data. Then the other thing we did was for 75 directors, most of whom were actually, in fact, all of whom were respondents to the survey, we were, and were willing to uh, give us greater uh, uh, um, uh, engagement, we actually conducted interviews with them. So we were able to get a lot more qualitative data to justify or to understand better um, the, 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 uh, the findings that we're I'm going to share with you. Well, understandably, there are challenges with surveys. Um, one is that you worry about is that the people that respond to the surveys uh, tend to be uh, maybe a biased sample that not, you don't get a random sample of people that respond to the surveys. And we certainly worried about that. I don't pretend that we, we solved that problem, but if you look at the characteristics of the directors who responded to us versus the characteristics of board directors in general, they look like they're roughly comparable. There are a few differences, but they look roughly comparable. The same is true that if you look at the boards that they're representing, they look comparable to the boards that we were able to compare if they're public companies to um, uh, the population. The second concern is, uh, is that um, if you ask people to evaluate their performance, they tend to think they're doing a good job. Uh, and we'll call that response bias. And, and we certainly worried about that. And you'll see examples of that where um, it looks like uh, the, the, the directors that we, that we surveyed uh, give themselves a little pat on the back at times. But I think what's important uh, is to note that there is some variation in the way that they respond. There's some things that they give themselves a, a good, a good uh, grade on, and there's other areas where there's clearly some unease that you'll see, which I think is informative. The other thing that we tried to do to, um, to control for that is we use what's called a marker variable, um, which is unrelated to their evaluations of the board performance that helps to try to control for some of this. Imperfect, but at least an attempt to try to do this. And then, of course, the last piece of this is we can't ever uh, resolve the problems of inferring causation. But I think the other piece of it that, we, that we, we really wrestle with is when we look at a survey, what were the rationales or the logic that was underlying what directors were um, responding to and about? And so we we're able to get at that through the qualitative data. So um, what were the governance metrics that we looked at? So first of all, the effectiveness, what's the, if you look at the board governance effectiveness, there are three metrics that we look at, or three overall metrics that we constructed. One is, how effective is the board at managing risks and overseeing the management of risks in the organization? And we looked at a lot of, uh, an, a number of questions that were related to that. One was, for example, around compliance. Another was on the board's role in terms of, uh, as a steward of the firm's assets. Uh, what was the board's role in financial planning? What was the board's role in cybersecurity? What was the board's role in ensuring that there was a good tone at the top? Maybe getting at this question of culture for the company. 
The second area we looked at <clears throat> was on strategy guidance and appraisal. That is, what's the board's role in overseeing strategy at the organization? And we asked about questions more generally. What's the board's relationship with the CEO on strategy or alignment with the CEO on strategy? What's the board's alignment amongst itself on strategy? And then we looked at more specific questions that were focused on particular types of strategic issues. What was the board's effect evaluation of its performance on M&A, on innovation, on global, global, global growth? <clears throat> and then the third category we looked at in terms of uh, was management's, management evaluation and selection. Um, how does the board rate itself on questions around compensation? You'll hear more of that from Alex later that today. Um, how does the board evaluate itself in terms of CEO evaluation or in terms of succession planning? So these are the three areas that we focused on in terms of uh, board governance effectiveness. So you can see here in terms of the specific questions, um, some of the both uh, patting yourself on the back, the, the giving yourself an A, and, uh, and some of the areas where the board was maybe a little bit more sanguine about its performance. So these ratings, when I say 94%, that's the percentage of the respondents who gave, who gave themselves either a four or a five out of a one to five scale. So it was either above average or excellent in terms of the way that they um, evaluated themselves. So you can see that they rated themselves very highly as stewards of the firm's assets. Um, they rate, rated themselves very highly in terms of setting the right tone for the company with the CEO, uh, or in terms of being aligned with the CEO or themselves on strategy. But what's interesting is that if you actually start to probe a little bit more deeply on the strategy areas in M&A and technology and innovation and global expansion, there you see the board being not quite so confident or the respondents not being quite so confident about how the company is doing. So at the, at the high level, thinking they're doing a pretty good job, but maybe at the more micro level on specific issues, perhaps not quite so confident. The other area that's, uh, that's interesting or worth noteworthy is on risk management. In terms of cybersecurity, um, much less confident. Only 31% gave themselves a four or five in, on, the, on that scale. And in terms of CEO succession planning, also an area where the board was uh, less sure that they were doing a good job. Uh, if you look at the overall summary statistics, you see that on risk management was the high. They gave themselves a 69%, gave themselves an above average or an excellent rate rating, 63% for strategy guidance, and lower on management evaluation and selection. I'll give you at least a flavor. It's hard to do this. Geordie told me I had 20 minutes, so I'm, I'm constrained here in terms of trying to summarize a lot of data in 20 minutes, but I'll try to give you a flavor for some of the qualitative results that we talked that, that we uh, that we learned. So this is just to give you a sense on the risk management piece here. Um, what were what were the directors that we that we heard responses from saying about cybersecurity? And you can see that where the, the, the where there were concerns or where they felt that they were not doing a great job, um, the board lacked expertise. We don't have the expertise on this issue and we weren't doing anything particular to try to get it. If you looked at the directors that, that gave themselves a better grade on cybersecurity, they said, you know, while we may not have the expertise, um, we're going outside and creating an advisory board of experts that can help us with this. Um, we're appointing a new director who's got expertise. We're hiring a consultant who's coming in and helping with this issue. In terms of uh, ratings on um, strategy, this was, these are some of the ratings around M&A. Um, so uh, the high ratings on M&A. Uh, we, we reserve time to talk about the firm's strategy at every meeting, and that helps us be prepared uh, for reviewing acquisitions. We regularly go through companies that management's interested in and why those companies fit the strategy versus the low ratings. Management never spent the time we needed to help us understand strategy. As a result, with all the time pressures that arise in acquisitions, when you have to move quickly, the board simply went along with what management recommended. There was no real discussion of whether the deal made sense. In terms of uh, management's evaluation and selection, I talked about two types of low responses. In terms of pay, um, the CEO of using compensation is highly political. 
The CEO is active in setting compensation, making the directors uncomfortable. Um, where there were predefined criteria for a, the variable part of compensation, it wasn't applied. And the answer was simply, yes, he, it normally is a he, deserves it. And succession planning, low ratings, we just don't talk about it. It's uncomfortable, the CEO's in the room, why would we want to talk about that? Um, or uh, another comment, uh, we've got a very powerful CEO and, and doesn't want us to even discuss the CEO successor issues. So what about the uh, independent variables? And we're going, to, we're going to have four metrics that look at um, internal board operations and governance. So one is what uh, we'll call director engagement. And that is um, questions around, are you prepared for meetings? Or are direct directors on your board prepared for meetings? Are they engaged in meetings? Um, what happens outside meetings? Is, is there further levels of engagement or in, 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 by the board? Interpersonal relationships. So we think that that would be an important factor in, in the board's, board's discussions. Um, what's the communi CEO's communication with the board? Um, what's the level of collegiality within the board? There are, these are just some examples. There are, many, there are more questions than, than, than these that we asked. Um, the board meeting management. How effective is the board at actually managing the meetings? Um, does it have the right ag the agendas that items that it's that it's interested in? Um, is it uh, does it do a good job on time management? Uh, is there independent thinking? Is there open and candid discussions that take place? And then lastly, uh, what I call the internal governance of the board. Um, do you have the right people on the board? The right skills. Uh, do you, what do you do for onboarding for new people, new, new board members? Um, what do you do if you've got a problem director? How do you address that? So those are some of the questions that, that sort of comprised these, these four internal operations categories that we created. And then we also looked, based on prior research, we asked directors about other important metrics, uh, external influences. Is there an activist shareholder or an activist in, in the stock? Um, is there a major shareholder? Who is the major shareholder? What are the characteristics of the board? Its independence, the the break, the, the number of people on the board, etc. Um, what are the what are the characteristics of the particular respondent? And largely, what are the characteristics of the company? Uh, what's its size? Um, what's its industry? Uh, what's its performance and, and profitability over the last year? So again, you can see a range of res of results. Right. So high ratings, uh, the agenda reflects our priorities. The committee work, committees work well. My voice is heard on the board. Um, in general, the board meetings effective. We get candid discussions, et cetera, et cetera. Where are there low readings? Time management. Right. Typically, time management, we've got a bunch of things we have to do. We really don't get time to discuss the important issues. Um, we don't really address problematic directors. We're not really that engaged between meetings. We don't really provide enough training for new directors. Uh, and we don't really evaluate individual directors. So some examples of where there's some variation here. Again, not surprising that when you ask people to rate themselves, they rate themselves on average highly, but at least you can see that there's some variation here. And again, you look at the, um, the, the average scores, you see, you know, they, they seem to be, be uh, doing pretty well or considering themselves to be, be doing pretty well, uh, perhaps with the exception of internal governance. <clears throat> so just to give you, again, I'm not going to give this for every item here, but at least some qualitative responses on interpersonal relationships uh, and high responses. We've got a collegial board environment where directors enjoy working with each other, increasing their willingness to share, learn from each other and exchange ideas. The CEO lays a groundwork for a relationship with the board by providing transparency about what's really going on in the organization. So the board's got, is, is got candid and complete information. At low ratings. Too much me and way too, too little, too much me and way too little us. The boardroom's a challenging environment influenced often by big egos, low self-esteem and self-awareness and politics. We haven't been effective in, in dealing with a highly aggressive CEO. We put too much trust in the CEO and the management team. 
So just to give you a flavor for when you ask people about where their concerns are, these are some of the responses that you get. So just to give us a, be able to ca cal calibrate in some sense what a low rating means. Does it mean something that, is, that, that sort of resonates with us? So what we, what the, the, the last thing we do here is to say, well, is there any relationship between these two things, between these two sets of variables, between the effectiveness variables and the independent variables on the board's internal governance and internal operations? And we'll, we'll, we're going to put a, include a, um, the last, oh, that wasn't what I thought that was. We're going to put, a, a, the last question here is we're going to put this halo marker to try to control for um, the overall optimism and bias that we might think in there by saying we're going to include a variable which says, do you enjoy serving on the board? Which is sort of a positive question, but if it, and hopefully picks up any bias that would be reflected in the, in the answers that the, that the um, directors are giving us. So what do we find? We find, first of all, that, that it doesn't matter whether you put those um, board internal operations variables in there one by one or put them all in together or even aggregate them, we find that um, there's a very positive relationship between all each of the three outcome measures, each of the three effectiveness measures in terms of corporate governance and the internal operations of the board. Just to give you a sense of how significant they are, so if you gave, had a one unit increase, remember we had, we used, for most of these questions, we used a one to five Likert scale. Um, so if you had a one unit increase in board meeting management ratings, you would get a 1.1 standard deviation increase in risk management effectiveness. If you did a one unit increase in interpersonal relations, you would get a one standard deviation increase in strategy guidance and appraisal. So these effects are at least seem to be, seem to be both statistically significant, but more important sort of economically significant that maybe not surprisingly that as you uh, improve the governance on the effectiveness of the board's internal operations, uh, that translates into effectiveness of the, uh, of the board as a governing agent for the, for the shareholders. So lastly, uh, some robustness checks. Um, we used a different marker variable. We used, uh, has serving on the board enhanced your professional reputation? Uh, we used the individual because we, we aggregated the questions. We had many questions. We aggregated them into these categories. We tried using individual survey questions. We used factor analysis to try to figure out what the right groupings of variables were going to be. Uh, and those were, the results were basically unchanged. As I said, we also have data for um, US private companies and non-US public and private companies. And actually the results are remarkably um, similar that you see these same effects for both types of firms. Certainly if you're at a family board, there may be some different dynamics that are important, but some of these same parameters seem to come, come into play in determining whether the, um, the board seems to be considering it, that it's doing a good job of managing itself and whether it's doing a good job of actually overseeing risk management strategy and, and, and the CEO. And then the last thing is, of course, which I, I readily acknowledge, that we're looking at your evaluations of your, how you think you're affecting the, the governance of the firm. Uh, and you know, maybe you're wrong, right? So the last thing we did, we, we did give in the survey, we gave the, um, the respondents the opportunity to actually tell us what their company was. We didn't ask them to do it. We, in fact, we gave them, most of them were anonymous, but we did ask them if they were willing to give us the data on um, what was the name of the company, we could actually go and corroborate some of the, some of the, 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 the evidence that they gave us. And, and was it, there was at least, we, these, these results are particularly exploratory because the numbers, are, the numbers are small and there's strong selection bias, et cetera, et cetera. But at least we did find that, um, Companies which had um, and the, the providers us the names, where they had strong, they had uh, weak strategy appraisal rating, were more likely to have good wool write-offs in, in the next year, suggesting that they weren't making great acquisitions. Um, if they, uh, the, they if they had um, particularly poor CEO succession planning ratings, they were more likely to appoint an outsider as uh, in, in the subsequent year or two. Uh, to the to the as a CEO, 
And if they rated them, their CEO evaluation ratings lowly, uh, poorly, um, they, they had a much lower ratio of stock-based compensation in, the, in their, um, the, the ratings or in their, for their CEO. So in summary, um, most of the directors rated themselves pretty highly uh, on, on risk management oversight um, was highest, followed by strategy guidance and appraisal, and then risk, then management evaluation and selection. But there were important areas where we noticed that um, the board wasn't as quite as optimistic or positive. Cybersecurity risk management, strategy guidance on technology and the specifics, innovation, globalization, global expansion, M&A, succession planning, um, and evaluation of future management talent. And the same was true in, in how they rated themselves internally for their own operations. But there were also exceptions there. In particular, they didn't feel confident that they were doing a good job of evaluating individual directors or addressing problematic directors, training new members. So areas of uh, opportunity. And then uh, there was at least in terms of the relationship between these, there seemed to be a strong correlation between them. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and let Geiska, thank you, Paul. Have, have a turn. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay. All right. So thank you. Thank you, Paul, for this excellent uh, presentation. So um, uh, I guess my job here is to provide a little bit of context. Uh, or, on, on, on Paul's findings. And um, for those of you that, that might not be that familiar with academic research, let me show you a little bit, you know, what we have learned from, um, let's say, academic research in, in finance and, and accounting. This is where, where Paul is actually uh, coming from. So here you have basically, um, I would say, the classic, uh, classical questions on, 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 this, on this space, you know, whether the structure of the board determines the quality of the board, you know, the famous one size fits all, who monitors the monitor, you know, regulation, can we fix things with, with regulation and, and research on certain uh, practices. And um, you have here an overview of the of the results. I mean, we could talk about, you know, these specific points, but I mean, the, the point I want to make here is that uh, recommended governance practices do not necessarily have the, the intended effect. And I think that this is also extensible to other components of the corporate governance uh, system in general i mean if we we talk about legislation you know uh, regulatory oversight proxy advisors rating agencies uh stock exchanges uh stock indexes the media politicians i mean uh, the literature provides uh, let's say settings in which they have a positive effect but in, there's also instances where actually the effect uh, is not positive or even even negative right so this sort of suggests that the let's say the external corporate governance system might might not be enough we might need uh, something else right so uh, how are things evolving i think that this is also important to you know to understand the context where where are we where are we heading to i guess you know we are all familiar with the, the increase in in the percentage of independent directors after socks right um and after the financial crisis, actually, you see also a very uh, dramatic increase in the in the limits of of e and insurance. I mean, suggesting that uh, now uh, directors are assuming a higher risk than than, than before. And uh, I guess we are also aware of, uh, let's say, this tendency in the U.S. Uh, of let's say going towards a, a lower number of, of of public companies, which also has implications in terms of cor corporate governance because private firms. Uh, are um, let's say subject to a different level of, of scrutiny okay. uh, the probability of hostile takeover has also evolved over time um, maybe you know perhaps it suggests that uh, let's say the, the takeover market is not as a strong government me mechanism as it, as it used to be in the past and at the same time uh, we uh, we are observing the eruption of uh, index investing uh, large asset management firms. Uh, here you have data on the on the big three. The big three meaning the the, the three largest uh, asset management uh, companies: uh, Vanguard, Blank, BlackRock, uh, State Street. Uh, this might have implications for corporate governance practices. This is from a recent paper I have with co-authors. We look at the 
basically the, the, the dispersion of CEO pay uh, over time. And we see that uh, actually there is, a, there is a dramatic decrease in, in the dispersion of CEO pay levels, uh, meaning that CEO compensation contracts are getting more and more similar to, to each other. And we also find that this is actually related to the influence of proxy advisory firms. Uh, other things that I, I would say are remarkable, these are recent findings by the, by the economic literature. There is a, a, a dramatic increase in the average markups. I mean, it seems that this is concentrated in the upper uh, part of the distribution, uh, what is called the, the superstar firms. Uh, and uh, there is also a, a dramatic decrease in, in, in union membership, okay? So, and, uh, you know, a, 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 a decrease in the, in, the, in, the, in the fraction of GDP shared by, by labor. So, I mean, this, again, this also uh, probably going to have uh, influence on, on, on the corporate governance space uh, and the cl climate emergency, right? Uh, it looks like we are not going at the pace that we should be going, you know, to, to meet the, the, the net zero objective by 2050, right? And perhaps because of this concern, we are seeing uh, also a dramatic increase in uh, in ESG investing, okay. So here you have data on PRI uh, signatories. I guess I mean, we're sort of like uh, we we sort of know this, but when you actually look at the magnitudes, and this is what is interesting to collect data, uh, it's actually very eloquent, right? I mean, it sort of suggests that we are definitely moving towards a, a different equilibrium. Here you have data on the number of of uh, ESG labeled funds, right? I mean, EPFs, uh, open-ended funds, right? So, and we have ESG activism. Okay, so here, here you have a, a fam the famous case of NG number one and uh, Exxon. Uh, the interesting thing I would point out here is that these sort of events, activism events, are uh, accompanied by a negative market reaction, suggesting that maybe shareholders are willing to, you know, to assume a cost, uh, you know, to improve uh, sustainability or ESG performance. Okay? Uh, but there also, uh, there's also the concern of greenwashing. Okay? Here you have some examples of allegations against uh, BlackRock. Uh, we have seen, you know, some some moves uh, recently in, in the enforcement space. Uh, so, but uh, there is also evidence at the same time that uh, this activism is actually having some effect. Here's some recent paper uh, that finds a, a negative association between uh, CO2 emissions and uh, big three ownership. And it looks like, I mean, this, this negative relationship is concentrated in recent years, okay? So sort of like suggesting that in recent years, you know, we are, we are, we are, we are, getting, we are getting up of uh, uh, speed, right? And this, again, might also affect uh, governance practices. Uh, here you have, I think, a very, very eloquent data on the, on the evolution of, uh, let's say, the practice of including ESG metrics in compensation contracts. I mean, it's going up uh, uh, big time, right? So, I mean, what is my takeaway? I mean, I could get, get going, right? Because we haven't talked about, you know, technological disruption, geopolitics, and I mean, it looks like things are, things are changing a lot. They are th changing very rapidly also in the, in the governance space. So my takeaway from this, while important, the external corporate governance system has limitations, and in particular, the structural attributes of the, of the board. That means that the internal functioning of the board is going to be crucial. We, we need to understand it, right? And the job of directors is becoming increasingly uh, challenging. That means, in my mind, that uh, culture is meant to uh, play a very important role. Okay? Uh, but how can we learn about this? That is the problem, right? Because uh, we don't have data on uh, culture and, uh, and, you know, and the internal operations of the, of the board, right? So, I mean, it looks like the only way to address this, you know, to approach this is uh, field research, experiments, uh, surveys, right? And this is what Paul does, okay? Um, but there is a long tradition of, uh, let's say, uh, survey research in, in corporate governance. Actually, I learned this from Anelou. She, uh, she, you know, educated me, you know, in this, in this part of the, of the literature. And I, I also, I mean, for me, it's, it was kind of like a, a discovery, right? Because, uh, I mean, they, they, they actually tackle very, very interesting issues, internal board dynamics, board relationships to a variety of stakeholders, notably employees the teamness, right? I mean, the efficiency of, of the teams at the, at the high level, uh, personality characteristics, uh, cognitive biases. I mean, of course, we cannot address this with archival data, with external uh, data, right? So what, what is, uh, you know, Paul's survey adding to this? I think that to begin with is adding breadth and depth, okay? So they make a tremendous effort, you know, to contact a very large number of executives out there, okay? So I guess, you know, this is very powerful. Right. 
and they also are very thorough in terms of depth, like, uh, you know, the sort of issues that they address and they tackle, right? I mean, you can see there all the, the things that they look at in terms of board effectiveness. I'm not going to expand on this because he has, uh, he has already uh, de described the findings, right? Uh, in terms of, let's say, internal uh, board operations. I mean, this is, this is a very ambitious uh, uh, exercise, right? And I think that the findings are also very, very interesting and very telling, right? I mean, uh, to, uh, to the, I mean, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, you know, this, this, this association between internal uh, board operations and board effectiveness, even though very important, has not been documented any, anywhere, right? And what I found especially interesting is actually, you know, to take survey data and correlate it with uh, actual data, external data, right? Like financial performance. I understand that these tests, I mean, you acknowledge it, that they, they have a lot of limitations and the, the results are actually my, my, my might not be that conclusive, but I think that this is novel and, and interesting and, and definitely worth knowing. Okay. And, uh, so how how can we improve this? Well, maybe one way uh, you know is to see whether there's something missing there. Okay, uh, even though it's very thorough, right? But there could be something missing, something we, we could complement in the in the future, right? And uh, maybe one way to think about it is, is you know to think about the the, the functions of the board. And I, I took uh, Jordi Canal's recent. Uh, a book uh, that uh, actually, you know, identifies the, the six functions, or maybe there are more, but, you know, he talks about six, six functions of the board. And actually, uh, Paul's surveys uh, covers uh, a bunch of them, actually, right? We could, we could discuss whether, you know, it covers them in, in, in de in deeply enough, but uh, it's definitely uh, there, right? But there are, maybe there are some things that you might consider and uh, that... Uh, uh, are not in the survey, right? Like, for example, things related to purpose, uh, engagement with shareholders and other key uh, stakeholders. Maybe, maybe, you know, these are potentially important things um, that are not covered by the survey and could be something left for, for future research. In summary, okay, so in summary, the economic context and the corporate governance system are evolving fast in, an, in a complex way. Yeah, so, uh, therefore, analyzing board structures is not enough. We need we need more research on the internal functioning of the of the board. Uh, we need to maybe we need to integrate somehow the findings from different research fields. Uh, I think that you know Paul's attempt for that is a, is a very nice one. You know to provide recommendations for practice and for for regulators. Right now, how to do this? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure how to do this, uh, let's say, in, uh, in, in a rigorous way. Uh, I think that this is something that maybe, you know, we could, we could and we can discuss this. Maybe, maybe Paul um, in the Q&A, you know, could, you know, provide some insights about this. But uh, there is something, I guess, something that we in academia need to figure out. And, uh, you know, to finish, I would say that it would be also very interesting, you know, to get the input from practitioners and see what do you want to know <laughs> that you academics are not, let's say, telling us or are not able to these, these, these questions that you, you have not been able to provide answer for. Okay, that's, uh, that's what I have. Uh, thanks again, Paul. Thanks again, Alan Luz. And uh, I'm going to leave the stage to Anna Luz. Back, back to Anna Luz. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's very kind of you to say that the stage is mine, but in fact, I think it's yours, right? Because this is the time and the opportunity to see if there, I have many questions, but obviously, you know, this is the time to, to see and, and, and hear from you. So any questions around what we have discussed? The microphone, yes, I think they're coming from the back already. So if you would just raise your hand and the microphone will come your way. Yeah, Gillian, yeah. Well, I guess I'll kick things off, but I'm really excited about one of the, 94% um, thought they were really good at stewarding assets, right? But yet you had a 43% for talent management. And we know one of the charts that you didn't put up that I would have loved to see the trend was the intangible assets of companies being the vast majority of their assets. So was there anything in the interviews that came up where you had maybe more of an intangible driven firm that might have had differential because those seem to be um, inconsistent in my mind. And so I'm trying to understand how maybe boards can handle that better. I think it's a great question, Gillian. And I, and I, would, I would say that it's more about the way that people, when you're talking about assets, they think about the physical assets of the company, like cash and receivables and inventory and plant. They don't think about the intangible assets as much of, of the company. Um, maybe they're measured, maybe they're not measured frequently not measured. 
But I think that when you look at the specific responses to questions around M&A, which creates intangible assets actually on the books, or technology, or uh, innovation, those are intangible assets really that, that I think boards probably don't think about them as assets in that way. They think about the strategy side of it, they don't think about that. And when, when, they, when they think about, the, about asset stewardship, they're thinking really about um, tangible assets, I, I would say. So, that, so I, is there a disconnect? Yes and no. There's a disconnect in the sense that they focus on the tangible side of things. They really probably should be thinking about all of the assets, including those that are not measured. So I, yeah, please continue. Thank you so much for your presentations and for the commentaries. So just to push you a little bit more on this question on the intangibles, it seems, and I'm sorry I haven't read the paper, but it seems like your results in terms of the weakness of the board was very much focused on the people as well, right? Like on the evaluation of other directors, the CEO succession, and just to connect it to the panel, it seems to me that that is also related to the culture of the organization in a way. So would you, I know I'm making a big yeah. assumption here, but would you, when you interview people, when you interview the directors in your more qualitative work, did you send some of that? Could you talk about, so in other words, could you talk a little bit on the culture of this organization? Did you send it somewhere? And related to that, the purpose. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that, um that the culture of the board, or at least the board's responsibility is to oversee the culture of the company, uh, unquestionably. I don't think we can make, at least based on the data that we've got, a strong relationship between what the culture of the board is and the culture of the company. There are a few questions that sort of get into that a little bit, but they're, but, but, I, but I don't think I, I would say that they're deep enough to be able to sort of make that conclusion. But I certainly think that that you're right that the board's the board's responsibility is to actually ensure that there's a a well-functioning culture if there's however you define that um and what role the seat the what role the ceo and the board together play in that is is an, an important piece of what creates the firm's culture it's a very interesting survey so this might be beyond the scope of the survey but maybe you addressed it in the interview so you mentioned it's the board's responsibility to um to control the, to, to oversee the culture what information does the board have, have on it so how does it actually evaluate it so are they expected to go to make some unscheduled site visits or, or is there a particular director who's responsible for it so what information do they get on something which is quite intense so so i think that I did certainly when in, in talking with uh, in qualitative research, talking with boards about how do they get their hands around that question. It's a really good, it's a really good question. And the the in directors that I that I talked to who are most articulate about that said that um, they get it from a multitude of, of ways. One is um, frequently uh, they would make their board meetings would would take place in different parts of the of the organization. So they might they might move around the world. If they do that, they'll get a chance to meet people in different parts of the organization. And they use that as an opportunity to sort of get a, get a sense of the pulse of the culture of the company. So meeting people uh, outside the top management team uh, is, some, is one thing that, that they would try to do. Uh, even if they're within the headquarters, just getting to sort of have dinner with people or meet people offsite. And if, the, if there's a sense that they're not given reasonable freedom to access a, a people deeper in the organization, they would see that as a red flag. The other is, uh, which I thought was interesting, was one of the directors in a company that um, uh, said, we play a pretty important role in uh, an annual survey that an independent organization puts together for our, all our employees, where part of the questions in the, in the survey relate to the culture of the company. And we have some input into that in terms of as the, as the board as to what those questions are going to look like. And we get that data on an annual basis to judge how employees themselves are seeing the culture. Thanks. 
Um, it strikes me that the person who owns board culture more than anybody else is the chairman. And there wasn't an awful lot of discussion about the chairman in, in yeah. your paper. Um, are there any learnings in relation to where the chairman comes from, how they're appointed, their tenure, their qualifications? Is there anything that we can learn on that? So you're right. I, we, didn't, we didn't dig into that particular um, question. I, I think that you're right that the chairman plays a critical role. I suspect, since um, we're on this side of the Atlantic, that you're going to say next that isn't it a problem that most U.S. companies have the chair and the CEO in the same thing, in the, many of them in the same person? And I think that that's, a, I think that's right. I, I find that a um, uh, potential problem. Um, the, the advantage behind it is that, uh, is that at least the, the chairman is fairly, or chair is fairly well um, acquainted with, uh, in, in, intimate with the, with the firm. Um, but I, I think almost universally, if there were problems, it would come back to the chair. That was a weak, quote unquote, people would say there's a weak chair. That is a chair that doesn't, uh, doesn't take the position of the board or take the, make sure that the board's getting the right information and make sure that the types of issues that, that I were discussed in the, in the survey are, are getting dealt with in the board, that the, the, the chair is seen as an important, a critical player in that. If the chair is the CEO, that may be that may be part of the problem, or it may just be also that the chair isn't particularly effective. I saw a question here. Solved already? Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. For sure, it's a very interesting topic and very relevant for not only for the economical transcendent or financial um, effects in the companies, it's very important as well for the uh, legal issues. Uh, based on that, probably you didn't ask them, the board, on the legal issues, but I consider it's very important to link <coughs> this um, culture board performance with these legal effects. It's very important because sometimes we have a lot of legal issues in the company and we are not linking them with the, this culture uh, performance and sometimes even rela related to uh, innovation or even with um, the, uh, the management in itself. And my question is, did you ask something on that or even you didn't then ask them something on that? Did you realize something on the way that they realize the link with these both topics because they are transcendent for the legal issues relative sometimes we are uh, focused on solve some legal points but the roof of these problems are in this managing uh, culture in the company thank you so i think i think legal issues affect the board in, in multiple ways uh, some of which weren't really discussed in the in the survey, uh, but but I, I teach in board programs, and and I'm, I'm certainly very much aware that directors worry about their legal liability. Is that what you're thinking about in in this? Um, I I think that actually, uh, given as fiduciaries, they clearly have responsibilities, legal responsibilities. But, but in the US, uh, the business judgment rule gives them quite a lot of uh, scope to exercise that. And, and I, I think actually the bigger concern for directors isn't so much their legal liability as their reputational risk. So for me, that would be a bigger issue that I would be worried about as a director. Let me, let me pick it up in a different way. And that is when you, one of the things that did come out, she, out of the survey was, uh, especially around risk management, um, many, several directors that we spoke to were, were concerned that more and more as more and more regulatory requirements were placed on the board, that um, the board ended up doing, becoming more of a check the box, having, having more of a check the box mentality. And particularly, you know, in, initially when many of these were Sarbanes Ox, came from Sarbanes Oxley, well, right after Sarbanes Oxley, the board was very attentive to these issues. But over time, it becomes much more of a repetitive and check the box type approach that, that the board takes on some of these issues. And, and I think the concern that several directors raised was that that's not necessarily a, 
achieving the, the, the purpose that was intended when this legislation was passed. So that's a different take on legal aspects, but it's, it seems to me also relevant. Well, do you envision any way to certify externally the quality of, of, of the culture of a, of, a, of a firm? I mean, or, or do we want to do that? Uh, I mean, is, is it something that would be helpful for, let's say, external investors? Or you know would generate let's say incentives to improve that that culture, uh, or we should we should stay away from that. For... So who, when you say we, uh, are you referring to we as like uh, we as society, board, or we, we as a we, society, we as society, or, or we as, we as um, yeah. academics? We we as society. Let's let's put it that way. I mean, like you know, some sort of and this again, this might not be a good idea, but you know, some sort of like a rating, external evaluation, because I mean, basically your data is, is based on our self-evaluation, right? Yes. And for the reasons that you mentioned, this might not be, let's say, the, the, the first measure, right? Uh, uh, so, I mean, maybe, you know, some, some type of external evaluation could help, but what type of external evaluation, what could be, let's say, the pros and cons of this, let's say, the potential unintended consequences? Well, I, I as, certainly as an academic, I feel like, this is kind of like the unanswered question, or one of the unanswered questions. There's probably many unanswered questions, but this is an important one. It seems if you're interested in companies and, and how they perform, um, I, think, I think culture is, is important. And the challenge really comes back to how do we try to address it in a, in a rigorous way? And, and that I, I, um, I'll, give, I'll give some suggestions. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, the, one of my colleagues is, has been working on CEOs and she has been following CEOs and has collected data on exactly what CEOs do. Well, that seems pretty um, detailed and descriptive. I don't see why we can't also be doing survey type research that would focus on how do employees inside a company perceive their culture. I, I think actually companies ultimately will end up with companies wanting to do that themselves because and if the board thinks it's important to understand the culture there'll be more pressure to try to do that in large companies whether that then gets disclosed it's an interesting question right should should companies if they provide if they do this should they disclose that information if you look at um, Glassdoor and other um, online data databases that provide us with information on how people who are leaving companies are perceiving them that's also getting in the sense that it's something a little more substantive about culture so i think if we're creative we can think about ways of trying to measure culture as an academic and i think as a company you should also that it's also opportunities to be trying to measure that variable and try to judge how what are the issues in improving one's culture and and uh, because i i do just from just seems like common sense that the culture of an organization probably has an impact. Yeah. Yeah. And perceptions are also important, right? Because perceptions lead to actions and yeah. determine behavior. Yeah. So that's also important. Yes. Yeah, and that's extreme. I mean, that, that probably concludes the panel on exactly the theme of this conference, right? Corporate culture, how important is it? How can we measure it? How can we, you know, that, that in OB is, is always a perspective. What if you start measuring it? How do you... How do you make, sh you talked about your response bias also, but obviously do you yeah. want to have this kind of glorified, perfect picture of your, of your culture, whereas maybe the real picture in the end is more interesting. So I think with that, we, we got uh, a tremendous amount of insights already, but definitely also continuing uh, food for thought for, for during the break now and then in the, in the rest of the session. So for now, thank you so much, Paul, and thank you so much, Gaiska, and let's go to the coffee break, I think, and then continue. Thank you. Thank you.